Oh, shalom! Shalom, my friends. And shalom, my enemies, too. This is your old pal, Rabbi Saul Solomon, King Solomon, today, after my special coronation. And I am delighted in a royal way to be chatting with someone who is royalty of the theater, if you will. Someone who is, uh, has done shows off-Broadway, shows all over the country, he has written for cable television, for HBO as well. For example, he is a cable ace award winner for the Vietnam War stories that was shown on HBO. He wrote for The Days and Nights of Molly Dodd, if you remember that, uh, that show with Blair Brown on TV. Uh, he wrote the Richard Dreyfuss show, or wrote for it, The Education of Max Bickford. Off-Broadway, you might have seen his shows, which include Below the Belt and Rounding Third. He's had plays done at the Actors Theater of Louisville, Merrimack Repertory. He's taught theater at Columbia University, and he's been twice, not once, but two times to the Eugene O'Neill Playwright Center in uh, Connecticut. And he's even co-written a Broadway show. He's got a novel out called It Happened Here. Well, it's happening now. Won't you welcome to the neighborhood with a great big shalom, Richard Dresser. Shalom, Richard. Hello. Hello. It's great to be here. The best introduction I have ever received in my entire life. Oh, well, thank you. It all goes down from here. But uh, <laughs> you're lucky today it's a royal welcome because in honor of everything that's going on, I, King Solomon, talking to Richard Dresser. So, Richard, how you, I know you, you got already the novel written that you're pushing. And, and what are you working on right now, if you don't mind my saying? Like, what's in your typewriter that's not a typewriter anymore? I, I have, well, I, we're opening this play, Our Shrinking, Shrinking World, and um, I have a new play, All That Remains, about two couples on a remote island off the coast of Maine trying to figure out what to do with their lives as chaos ensues in the country. And I have a one-man show, I Will Not Perform It. That is my gift to the American theater, is I Will Not Perform It. And it's called Unstoppable. And it is about a motivational speaker. And when you see this play, your life will be changed by this motivational speaker. My good. Now, first of all, you haven't told us where we can see some of these things. Because I know our shrinking world is at New Jersey Rep. So yes, it is. you have to go to New Jersey to see it. This is a, this is <laughs> worth it, but it's New Jersey. And it's running from, um, oh, it's already open. It, 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 on May 4th, it started. When's the opening night? It, opening night is tonight. We, uh, we've had uh, two previews. And uh, we, have, we have a matinee this afternoon, and then it opens tonight. And uh, so it runs through the end of the month. And uh, it is very worth checking out, of course. Um, I'm completely objective about this. It's a wonderful, wonderful production. Some of the best actors I've ever worked with. And, uh, you, of course, you have to say that, but I'm sure it's true. Where is New Jersey Rep? It's, where, where the, it's, I... it's, in, it's in Long Branch. It's, Tom, you know, if you feel like um, your life would be enriched by a road trip to the Jersey Shore, this is the time to do it. Jersey Shore, Long Branch, right on the beach. It's a very intimate theater. You will feel as if you are on stage with the actors. And these are actors you want to be on stage with. It's really, it's really a terrific little theater. This is the second play I've done there. And uh, I'll come back again if they'll have me. This is so sweet. So let me ask you a couple of quick questions. It's wonderful we're getting you literally on opening night. When, do you have opening night rituals, like little things you turn around, you, do, you wear a certain shite or, or not, or what? Uh, no, I don't, uh, I, I don't do that. I, I, my rituals uh, might involve um, a cocktail or two. Um, I find that a wonderful tradition in the theater, um, which I plan to conform to tonight. But other than that, I'm not particularly superstitious. Um, I think that, uh, I, you know, I just think I, I, I go into it and uh, I feel, usually I feel very calm in this situation because, uh, and sometimes it's because I simply don't understand the situation. And that's a key to being calm. If you know too much of what's going on, there's all there's much more room for anxiety. I feel very calm. I love the show. I love the actors. Well, how much? Uh, since this is a new play, right? The, the, yes, the Brando. That play has never been done. Never been done before. I wrote it during the pandemic. But let me ask: How involved did the director let you get 
in the Jersey represent. Was there a moment when you say, okay, thank you, Richard. Now let me, I'm the director, go away. Or were you there everything, making changes or what? I was there. I was there right from the beginning. This is a director, Joe Kakachi, I've worked with many times before. He's a very good friend. And this was the most collaborative situation. We did the first read through and everyone was very excited about the play. And I thought my work is done. And my work was done until the second rehearsal. And once we got into the second rehearsal, I started cutting and coming up with new lines. And we really encourage the actors to be an active part of the process, which really makes it fun for me. It's not that I automatically do what they say, but the words have to be real coming out of their mouths. And so so it's it's been very collaborative. And one of the other reasons it's collaborative is we all live together. We're all living together in the same house. It's uh, it's a communal situation. So when you're casting a play at New Jersey Rep, you don't just cast the best actors, you cast people that you actually can live with for a month. And that 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 takes it that 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 makes it uh, a, a slightly smaller field of actors. But we have had an absolutely great time. It's taken important years off my life expectancy living in this communal situation. Um, but it's been a blast. It's been really fun. Well, I, I, I honestly don't know your person. Are you married, kids? I mean, are you was away from people that you would normally be seeing for a month? Yes, what? yes, I I am married and I have a son. And they came to see the show on uh, on Thursday, um, but this is uh, this is my uh, this is my second family. It's a temporary family for a month. And well, wait, so, but does it still, like after opening night? Do you go home? Or are you there until May twenty seventh when the, the show? No, no, I go, I go home. I'm going to go home tomorrow. But I live in uh, Hastings on Hudson, you know, north of New York City, and it's. You'll come back day. once or twice to see that. I, well, I'll come back. Yeah, I have a lot of friends showing up and agents and things like that. So I want to be here for. All of that, okay, all of that magic. Yeah. Now, at what point are you one of those people who, since you were allowed so much into the process by your friend, the director, were you still making cuts and changes up to like this dress rehearsal or a week before that is frozen? Let it be. Um, I made changes up until 1030 last night. And, and, is, that and is that fair to the actors? I mean, do they mind or are they like? Well, they well, love it. Better. They love it because these are not big changes. This is not like a huge um, monologue that's going to change the course of civilization. This is pulling out a line that just isn't getting the reaction that we wanted it to get. It's And they're very, very, they're, it's so collaborative. I really feel like part of what my job is now is to give them the play. They have to own the play. It's um, It's the closest I expect that I will ever get to childbirth. Where, you know, if you if you do everything right as a parent, your child uh, will break your heart and leave home. And if you do everything wrong, your child will be 37 years old, living at home and not mowing the lawn. So this is the process of <laughs> this is the process of the child uh, leaving home and breaking my but not breaking my heart. Now, you gave us kind of the themes of our shrinking world, but what would be the log line? And like, if you're going to audience members to come for a night to the theater, what story are they seeing? Well, they're seeing a story of the one shrink in a small New England town, and another shrink shows up, and the town is not big enough for two shrinks. And it's a competition they, uh, uh, between these two shrinks to save this one couple. And... What we learn, and this is not giving anything away, is that this couple hold, really holds the fate of humanity. So the stakes are extraordinarily high, and uh, but it's about two shrinks uh, competing with each other and trying to save these people. You've done this thing before where something that's seemingly prosaic turns apocalyptic, you know, has apocalyptic um, manifestations. Is that the right word? But, but what you did uh, below the belt, which yes. people would say is your most done play yeah. most popular play, the one that was done off broadway um you know it's it's guys working in some kind of yes i'm not sure where the hell they work but but they're working they're doing something and then you know what they're doing yeah. is bigger ramifications is yes that for you yeah yes well you know it's interesting you say that um because my wife brought this up she saw the show on thursday night and she loved it and i'm not sure she had a choice but she did love it and um and she said, you know, so, so often you are drawn toward apocalyptic themes. What do you think that is about? 
because I'm pr a pretty upbeat guy, but um, I don't, I, I honestly don't know, but I think it is, uh, it is how I deal with mortality. And I think it's how I deal with mortality exponentially bigger that it's, that it's, it's not just, it's not just me. It's all of us, what, are, what we're all facing. And that's really what this play is about because uh, I don't want it to sound like an eat your vegetables kind of situation, but it involves climate change. And it, it and and usually when climate change is discussed or brought up, it's very earnest and it's very or, or angry or you know, and it's it's urgent, of course. It's very urgent. That's that's why I wrote this play. But in the play, it's not dealt with as now we're going to stop and have a serious discussion about the fate of the world. It's all in these intimate terms of these characters trying to work out very, very personal things. Now, so my, sorry, please, yes. Well, I just feel like in general, um, when people laugh, um, their defenses are down and they can hear things in a very different way than if it's point counterpoint and you know and, and and we live you know in this shrill world of of everybody jabbering on cable news all the time and it's just like there are other ways in and i, I feel the same way about uh, the issue of, of book banning that there is there is another way in rather than calling people nazis I call people Nazis all the time. <laughs> I, know, I am I sick of such a shrill and loud, annoying world where people just getting on the internet and just shouting things. But <laughs> that's just me. Yes. <laughs> that is just you. No, it isn't just you. <laughs> now, let, me, let me ask you a question. We're talking yes. with Richard Dresser, the playwright. Speaking of Apocalyptica, is your novel, uh, where, I, I, where's the name of it? I'm, I'm missing uh, it. It happened here. It happened here. Is that also, what is that one about? Because that's pretty recent too. Yes, it's recent. I wrote it, um, for, I, I, I wanted to get it out before the 2020 election. As you might recall, we, we were all, uh, it, we were all panicked. And um, so I decided to write an oral history of an American family from the perspective of 2035. So this family is looking back on the 15 years that we're facing and it's how a family, you know, staying connected to each other and horrible things happen because uh, fascism takes over the United States and they end up, the family ends up uh, starting a commune in in uh, in Canada, but it's about the you know the problem I have with it at this point is, and that my friends have with it is that it, and this is not because I'm a genius, uh, but it's because it really did predict so much of what's go going on in the country, um, in terms of of people trying to take the country down, you know, a fa what I consider to be a fascist you know, to attempt to, to take down democracy. That's really what the novel is about, but it's told, again, a very intimate story through a family and how the family survives. And the, the book is called It Happened Here. It's published by whom and where can uh, we... Brown, Brown Books. Brown, Brown, Brown. Brown yeah. Books, yeah. And so uh, you, can, you, can, uh, you can get it anywhere. Um, and um, it's well, no, I, I looked in my closet. I don't have it. It's not quite anywhere. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> you okay. buy it certain places where you buy books. Okay. Think, All right. Mean? Anywhere you buy books, and it is um, again. It is. Um, I, it, it, I. I think it is a, a very entertaining read because it isn't. An, it isn't a screed. It isn't a manifesto. I could have written it as a political political satire, but I didn't. I wrote it as a family story, and it's a fourteen year old girl in 2035, trying to piece together what happened in her family. And, and, and uh, so, and it's all in dialogue form. There's no, there's no narrator. And I did that because I had never written a novel and I thought I will play to my strengths. I know that I can write this as a dialogue. And, and, and so you don't, you don't have a narrator saying, this is what this means and this is, what, but you get people talking and, and, and um, I've had actors read it and it's wonderful to hear it. Yes, so that's I, why I'm wondering if, if it was an all dialogue book, why did not you just make the, the next jump and turn it, or are you gonna turn it into a play? Well, I, you know, I had an offer to turn it into a play. It's a, it's a lot of characters and uh, it's hard to, you know, as you know, it's hard to get plays with big cast done. I, I, I'd, I'd love to do it as an either an, an, uh, a podcast or a miniseries because it's, 
because it's a story that just keeps rolling along about the ups and downs of the family. And you, through their dialogue, you see how people age and some of them don't make it through and some of them go to prison. You know, I mean, it's like, it's really what happens in an American family when uh, when times are tough. Now, now speaking, we were just talking about miniseries and, and, and the other media. You have written for other media, including... Yes. Um, series, TV series. Now, was Molly yeah. Dodd cable or was it network? I don't remember the... It was cable. Well, the reason you don't remember is because it was both. It started out on NBC and then it moved to Lifetime. And uh, yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, I, and I was living in New York and at that time, writing jobs in New York, TV writing jobs are very hard to get. And uh, oh, they're so much easier now. Yes. <laughs> well, there was there just weren't very many shows that were being shot in New York, and that was being shot. And I had never done any television. And uh, the producer, the creator of the show, Jay Tarsus, saw one of my plays and uh, invited me in for an interview. And I made every mistake that you could possibly make going for a, a critical job interview. I I didn't watch the show. My wife watched the show, so I got her. A, her synopsis of the show and I went in and Jay said um what do you think of the show and I said I I, I love the show and somehow he smelled a rat and he said who's your favorite character and I said well really you've woven such a rich tapestry of characters it would be a crime to pull one and he became weirdly intrigued by somebody who was sort of following the Lenny Bruce dictum of your wife finds you in bed with another uh, with another woman you just deny it you have and I would he tried to break me and he couldn't break me oh. and so he he get brought out two videotapes and he said I want you to write an episode but you need to <clears throat> promise you'll watch the show so you know what you're writing which I thought was fair enough. So I watched the show, wrote it, and I realized I loved writing television. So Jay, uh, he's one of my best friends now. And and uh, oh. as I remind him, our relationship started out with a lie. And but you're probably- did, gonna... well, What is it like, babe? Did you just kind of go home, watch the episode, write it? Or were you in the writer's room for that, or in the room for that week? Because so many of these things tend to be collaborative. There's eight writing, plus there's things that happened before in the series. You can't just watch two episodes. You gotta want, you know, know what everybody was for the whole seasons before. What does right. that take us through? Well, this was, this show, um, It's it was, uh, it, it remains probably my favorite job because it was a real writer's show and it wasn't a writer's room. I, I ended up watching a bunch of episodes and I hung out on set. There was no writer's room, but I, I hung out on set and I, you know, I, I spent a lot of time talking to people and I found it incredibly liberating for some reason. It was a time when, since there wasn't a lot of TV being done in New York, you could call up Nathan Lane or David Strathairn and say, you want to be on a show next week? It's great. And so it was a wonderful, wonderful show. And Blair uh, is still one of my great friends. And she was a delight to work with. She really was. Oh, yay. Oh, yeah. What about the, the dead Vietnamese uh, American soldiers in Vietnam that you wrote about? Were, were, were they fun to? No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing an HBO series. Um, about where, how did that come about? That came about just because it was at a point in my career where my plays were getting done and I had plays running at uh, uh, the um, the Pasadena Playhouse and, uh, you know, and uh, Laguna Playhouse, you know, and so my name was being bandied around out there in, in Hollywood and there was a woman that I knew, I'd known from the O'Neill Playwright Center, who was a producer on that show and she and she asked if I wanted to uh, to write for it. And I just had, I'd been reading, for some reason, I've been reading a lot about uh, the fall of Saigon and I wanted to write something about that because that situation of being helped by people on the ground and then leaving and leaving these people behind, you know, Afghanistan, you know, it's, it, it's, a, it's an historical story that keeps getting told. And I want, really want to write something about that. Oh my God, and it won the, an ACE award. That yes, pretty, yes. Pretty... Do award, are awards meaningful to you? Are you one of those, ah, it's just, it's glittering prizes, it doesn't mean anything, or it's like, it's nice to be recognized. Well, it's, it's uh, like everything else in life, it's, it's, it's nicer to win than not win. I, I, I mean, I don't 
I don't place a lot of stock in awards or reviews. Uh, I mean, because, I, and the reason is, is just that um, I think all of the external things can get in your way. I mean, and you can start, it, it wouldn't have, it wouldn't now, I, I mean, if you're a young writer and I mean, I just saw coming up, I just saw writers get overpraised and, you know, and the only place, once you're up on that pedestal, the only place to go is down. And it's just, uh, you know, I just thought that part of it, I'm not so, I'm not so noble that I never read reviews, but I've gotten great reviews and bad reviews. And ultimately I think I know the quality of the work and I know what I got to do to get to the next place. Well, do you wait until closing the day after closing to read the review or do you actually read it during the run or, or um, it, you know, I, I don't think act, most actors, I think, don't read during, don't read them during a run. For for a playwright, it's like you know the yeah. die is cast. It does it doesn't really matter. But what I used to do, I did a bunch of plays at the Actors Theater of Louisville in their the, the Humana Festival, and that would there would be reviews all over from everywhere. I mean, a lot of people from Europe. I had a whole. I had a whole career as a European dramatist because of plays that were done in really? Louisville and got reviewed over there. What I would do is get, they'd send me the review, a pack of reviews, like 60 reviews, and I would just read them very quickly. And the reason I would do it is I do pay atten attention if the same thing keeps getting mentioned. And, and the big thing for me actually is, is clarity if what I'm trying to do is not coming through. And if it's coming through and people are upset by it, I'm fine with that. But if it's not coming through, and if there's something that is not knocking people out of really connecting with the play, I, I pay attention to that. So have you ever rewritten after a show has been done? Have you have you looked at reviews and gone, you know, if this is done again or if this is published or whatever, um, let me tweak. Or do you just keep it under advisement for your next play? Yeah, well, I, I will, I, you know, when it, when all of those plays got published and before they were published, I'd go through and I would do tweaking, but I, I would never change anything because a critic didn't didn't like well, it. No, I, I mean, but not a critic, but a bunch of critics. You look yeah, at yeah, you, yeah, like, yeah. Oh, you yeah. know, that's, they're, they're right. They're right on that. Yeah, but, yeah. Now, let me those, ask are, you also, those are hard words to say. Uh, the critic was right. It's very, you know. <laughs> nice. You do realize that the producer of this program has been a theater critic for thirty-five years. But, we, 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 we. I, but I love critics more than I think they are. They are sort of, they sort of operate on a higher level than the rest of us. And I love. <laughs> yes. Well, maybe not higher than playwrights, but higher than right. most of the rest of the world. So, yes. so speaking of on a high, and no fair. You cannot say either rounding third or below the belt because they're your best known way. Yeah. Your, the favorite play that you've ever written. So it isn't about the success of it or how, how often it's done, but like the play, and it's no fair saying your latest one either. The one I'm working on now. Eh, don't give me that shit. No, no. Pick a play that you're really, really proud of that you love, that you wish were done in New York that we can all see or, or around the country. Well, um, there's a play, uh, I wrote a play about marriage called Gunshy. And, um, in, you know, in the course of writing a play, um, I tend to get so inside it that I um, am not always aware of how uh, people close to me might react to it. And I did this play in Louisville and uh, in a 300 seat theater in the round. And it was and uh, my wife came to see it. And um, I realized to my horror that the play was such a revelation of the very intimate things in our in our marriage. At one point, there were 299 people laughing and my wife. And so, and so, how, the, when you put that aside, when you go into the writers, because anytime you write about a married couple, how long have you been married to your, your, your wonderful- 40 wife? years, 41 years. First of all, Mazel McClick. But anytime you write about a marriage, it's gonna leak in there. If it's a comedy, fine, grand. But if suddenly, you, and, and do you like sit there and dread now in the writer's room, or can you forget, you say, I'm gonna write what I'm gonna write, and if my wife sits there and sees this, so be it. Yeah, you know, that, it's a, that's a very good question. And I deal with this a lot as a teacher, and I also, I, I do a lot of mentoring up with, with non-professional writers. And, and um, there's, a, there's a real fear of, uh, writing something that's genuinely going to hurt somebody else. But what I what I do and what I tell others to do is the first draft is for you. It's not for anybody else. 
And if you don't get the truth down there, it's not going to be as strong a piece of work as it could be. Having said that, once you finish that draft, you need to take a step back and then use your craft to either disguise or to soften whatever it is. But if you don't get the truth down, your truth, then, then why do this? I mean, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't bother doing it if I didn't feel like I could just really get it out there. As it turned out in that with, with Gunshy, um, I mean, it really was a great affirmation of marriage, but you had to crawl through a lot of broken glass to get to the finish line. And so, so first draft, I hate you so much. Oh, oh wait, she's coming to opening. Oh, right. I <laughs> yeah. love you ever so much. Exactly. <laughs> Fixed it. <laughs> <for you. laughs> We are talking. We have a couple more minutes. I know you, you cannot stay for the quiz, right? You cannot stay for the... the uh, unfortunately, I can't. I'm, I'm, I'm running around, but I'm, I'm, I'm seriously, I yeah. love doing this, talking to okay. you. Okay. Now, let me ask you, what was your experience on the Broadway show, um, Good Vibrations, which was based on, you know, they're, they're doing the jukebox musicals. This one was about yes. the Beach Boys. And yes. they got you in there to do sort of a light comic fun thing it, it was not a not a broadway hit but what was your experience working on good vibration right. well it was uh it was interesting i sometime i would like to write a book about it because it encompassed so much i'm obsessed with the beach boys i mean i have been since i was a kid when this opportunity came along i jumped at it and we the problem was that the producers only had seven more months on the option of the music and usually from the start of a musical to Broadway, if you're lucky enough to get years. to Broadway, seven years. And we had seven months. So I, I, I was jumping onto a, 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 a speeding train. My agent strongly, strongly urged me not to take the gig. But I thought, I'm never going to get an opportunity like this. And so we had a, a summer workshop uh, with all these this wonderful, beautiful young cast. And the audience went crazy it was just so much fun it does it was there was nothing pretentious about it, it was just fun yeah. and so um i thought that we were then going to go to, around to various regional theaters but they didn't have the time they didn't have the option and so we went straight to broadway a musical and i had never written a musical and so, so it was it, in a way exhilarating and in a way agonizing and uh, but the audience is really liked it it was we knew we were doomed with the critics and and um and there it really does matter i mean you I, we got a terrible review in the new york times and everything but i still run into people who just love that show and i met brian wilson i was gonna ask so do you have a brian wilson story well i met him very briefly he came up to me afterwards and he shook my hand and he said richard you made me proud of my work. And I thought, you know, I can die now. I mean, I would prefer not to, but I, but, I, but it was, it really made me happy because it was a story that people, it was a very simple story about kids going to uh, the California dream and, you know, and, uh, and it was super fun. It was just a rush. And this is not an excuse. It's just like, that no, was the, no, that was the, that's why I, I was curious about it, because that is your Broadway credit. You have a Broadway credit, which is an exciting thing to have. Yes. That's one of the off-Broadway shows. And yes. are you still teaching at Columbia? Yes, I am. I teach screenwriting at Columbia. I love it. I do. I teach a screenwriting workshop, 12 students, international students from all over the world. I teach a three hour, it's a three hour class every week. I love it. They're talented. They challenge me every step of the way. I challenge them. I get, we get very close. I, you know, I'm in touch with students from the past years. It's really, I never thought of myself as a, as a teacher, but I was put in this position and I've been there, I've been there eight years and I taught at Rutgers before that. And it's the best. I'm going to tell you about one other thing. I know you're out of time. I know the trivia beckons, but I'm just going to tell well, you. Well, you beckon. I wish you could stay for trivia, but I can take another minute. Okay, okay. I just want to tell you yeah. that um, that uh, 15 years ago, four of us in the Writers Guild 
started a group called the Writers Guild Initiative, and we do writing workshops all over the country with marginalized populations. We started with veterans. We're now work, working with exonerated death row prisoners, LGBT asylum seekers, survivors of, of human trafficking, and we have the greatest mentors, writers, who mentor these people. And I'm currently the president of this group. I tried so hard not to be president. I left meetings early. I did any everything I could humanly do not to be president. I love being the president of this group. And it is some- Now understand there's a population of Jews who do not live near delicatessens. <laughs> could you, you know, and I think this is the next group that your team really needs to work on. I'm just saying, I'm just saying. I, and, absolutely. And, we, we, we do. I, I don't mean to push you off. I would love for you to stay a little bit longer. But I want to tell everybody, most importantly, and by the look, look I'm, I'll even offer you some babka. Look at it. Um, <laughs> or, this, or, or locks. See, people don't need yeah, All right. Um, but I want to remind people, if you want to see at New Jersey Rap, yes. uh, um, I mean, handled, handed all these things. Oh, it's gun shy. There we go. But... <laughs> Go to New Jersey Repertory Theater. It's down on the South Jersey Shore. What? what I'm sorry. What town was it? It's Long Branch. Long Branch. Long Branch. It's, Long Branch. it's really worth the trip down. I'll tell you. And I'm not just saying that this because. Well, I am saying it because I wrote the play. I wouldn't be plugging another play, but it is. A, it's a wonderful production. You're gonna love. You're gonna love this. You'll fall in love with this cast. It's called Our Shrinking World. Get your tickets. Wait. wait. I'm sorry. Please. It's called Our Shrinking Shrinking World. Oh, I, I left like a shrinking yeah. of people. I've got so much shrinkage you shouldn't know from it. But our <laughs> shrinking, shrinking world. I'm so sorry, sorry, Richard no, no Dresser. Uh, NJrep.org, New Jersey. NJrep.org is the place to get your tickets to Long Branch, New Jersey. It's tonight. Are, are you doing a matinee uh, also on matinee, matinee this afternoon? Yeah, opening night. opening night tonight. Absolutely. Great. Numerous legs, or actually also don't forget to get his book, It Happened Here, which yeah. is from Brown. And as he said, you can get basically everywhere. You just have to pay a little money for it. Um, and what else? What else? Very quickly, can we look for it from you? Soon or anything uh, else? Well, well, uh, the, the, these new plays, I don't have I don't have productions lined up, but I will. And uh, this is but we have a, a, a documentary, Devout and Dangerous about uh, Daniel and Philip Berrigan, anti-war priests from the 60s and 70s. It's a wonderful documentary. We just started doing screenings and we're gonna set it up someplace so people will be able to see that. It will give you hope. People walk around saying, yes, things are terrible, but what can we do? These people, they went to jail, they led protests. They were huge, important anti-war and anti-new people in the 60s and 70s. Inspirational figures we show to young audiences and they go crazy. People don't know the Berrigans, they're worth knowing. I, I barely even know Bunny Berrigan. So this is, this is completely <laughs> Richard Dresser, a delight. I thank you ever so much for being with us. I wish you break, I, I won't say success because that's bad luck. So the breaking legs, kneecaps, testicles, whatever tonight for your show and all the other things you're doing, please come back in the neighborhood when you have more, all these more projects happening too, please. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure talking to you. An honor and a pleasure. Shalom to you. Okay, take care. Richard Dresser, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, yes, the snappy dresser indeed. And of course, how can I be more snappy than being King Solomon, my friend?